Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is going to be part five of our recap mini series. So if you haven't seen or haven't listened to parts one through four yet, please go back and review those as well. They'll greatly influence and help you with the material that we're going to cover today. This is going to be our third part of medical mnemonics and memory palace creation. This will round off our training for memory palaces and cover the mistakes to be aware of. Of course, for all past episodes, go check out freemeded.org slash podcasts. There you will find all of our past medical nemesis podcast episodes and the One Minute Preceptor podcast. If you have any questions or find any mistakes on the website, please do reach out on social media or by emailing me at medicalnemonist at gmail. We try to keep up with all the website glitches and everything, but don't always catch all of them, and especially when things are changing quickly, a lot of differences might pop up and go unnoticed. All right, so let's go on with today's show, where we left off with Yifan Zhao from Osmosis was discussing mind maps for memory palace creation. So let's see how Timothy Moser, the master of memory, uses a similar process for his students and when learning a new language. You might notice these similarities, indicating that we can use them for multiple types of practice. I actually love mind maps um, and specifically structuring memory palaces around those mind maps. So for example, uh, with the mind map, you have central topic, branch topics, and then subtopics within those branches. If you're using house or something as a memory palace, you can turn those branch topics into rooms, the subtopics within those into pieces of furniture within those rooms, and then divide your items of information from there inside each of those pieces of furniture. And so that's how I tend to structure my palaces. When you have a language, obviously, you have to learn vocabulary and phrases. There's a whole lot of information. There's the grammar and everything. What we found to be the most effective way to organize a memory palace is simply to divide the vocabulary into topics uh, or specifically into the categories of parts of speech. So you'll have one whole palace for prepositions, another for conjunctions, another one for pronouns, and so on. And then from there, you subdivide that memory palace into the the, uh, grammatical functions or the types of pronouns that they are. For example, direct object pronouns, indirect object. And that actually becomes a very easy way not only to learn the words, but also to learn the grammar and how they're used in a sentence. Because if you can use one indirect object, you can use all of them because they're all in that same place. So that explains how to sort the memory palace, but how to memorize the words and what they actually mean is going to be much more complicated. And that's something we can talk about if you like, just the way that the words themselves can be turned into their meanings. Sure. Uh, Does it have anything to do with sort of like a rehearsal or space repetition? That seems to be a common theme in in a lot of memory type trainings. Yeah, absolutely. The the reason for that partly is just because it makes more distinct and memorable to have the different scenes be just completely different. An amusement park, a plaza of um, like a marketplace plaza, shops and a home. Because a lot of our students don't really know a whole lot of grammar. And so if you just if you tell them preposition, they will they won't have any idea what you're talking about. But if you say a word from the amusement park, then they know exactly what you're talking about. And all they have to remember is that those words are prepositions or conjunctions. So you might be asking yourself, why are we learning about language learning? What is the relevance of this to our studies? Well, there are a lot of languages in medicine. And similar processes can be used for our topics that we have to study. The same concepts and techniques in medical education can be used, such as this example here. When you think about, for example, learning anatomy, you're learning different categories, but in an organic way as well. So, for example, you can learn the skeletal system or the cardiovascular system. But the fact is that they're all joined together organically And the dilemma tends to be you can either learn systems or you can go by area in the body, or you have to do some sort of combination of both. 
And for me, that's very much like learning a language. You can either learn vocabulary or you can learn phrases and practice with entire phrases, which you have to do if you're going to speak a language. Or you can take an approach that organizes it in such a way that you can do both and interchange your vocabulary in an intelligent way uh, because it's organized in the memory palace is organized by parts of speech. You have the different systems of the body, but within those systems, within those rooms in the memory palace, you keep, for example, all of the terms you need to learn from the skeletal system organized in terms of how the body is organized. Like one end could be the head and one end could be the feet. And you just learn uh, mnemonics for all of the terms you need to learn, each different bone, in locations that are intelligently placed throughout that palace. The dilemma that you'll come to when you do this, of course, is now you've divorced every system from ev every other system. And they obviously work together so closely, like the muscular and skeletal system, or lymphatic and uh, cardiovascular, that you really can't keep them separate like that. So you have to, um, just like with language, you can review your vocabulary in its palace, but you also have to review it in phrases and speak it out loud. So with anatomy, at the same time, you can review each of those terms from those systems, one system at a time. But then you also need to use diagrams and put the systems together visually so you can see how they all interplay in each area of the body. I would definitely divide your time pretty evenly between memorizing words and organically seeing like visually how it works in the body. That really should be as close to 50-50 as possible. And that's what I tell my students for uh, Spanish as well. They should spend half their time on their vocabulary and half their time on speaking phrases because you can't neglect one or the other. But with the way that words are acquired in particular, if you want to be able to use the words that you're learning, you want to be thinking about how they're pronounced and what the object is. Let's say that you're working on the area of the upper arm and shoulder. And so you have each of the different systems of the body in different areas of the palace. But in each of those different rooms, each of those different systems, you're specifically looking at your area that pertains to the upper arm and the shoulder. One of the words you'll encounter is the deltoid, which abducts the arm or moves it forward. And for me, that's a, it's simple to create a mnemonic for that. I just imagine a river that's branching out like a delta. In the river, in a particular place in my memory palace, this, um, this river-shaped muscle has an arm that's been taken away from somebody and is moving forward. So the deltoid abducts the arm, removes it away from the sagittal plane, and moves it forward. So that's my mnemonic for deltoid. But the main thing here is that I've used the stress syllable of the word. I'm not saying deltoid. I'm not mispronouncing it. I'm using deltoid and emphasizing that part of the word. And at the same time, I can jump to the corresponding place in my skeletal memory palace and learn scapula or clavicle according to um, mnemonics based on how those words are pronounced as well. So through all of our interviews with these physicians and educators and nemonists, they all seem to have a lot of similar processes that we can learn from. Just remember that this is a creative process, so there's no strict guidelines that must be followed. You have to play around with it, find which ones work for you and in which scenarios. Stick with it every day and just use a little bit. Bit by bit, you can gain skills in these techniques. You can mix mind maps and story method and memory palaces and other mnemonics tools. Timothy here also focuses on stressing the consonants or the, the strong sounds in words and uses those to base visuals off of. Ryan Orwig from StatMed Learning also has a similar process, and he describes how he tries to use these processes to get inside his students' minds so that he can monitor them while he's educating them in the process. I'm very interested in memory palaces as a very explicit, scoped and sequenced process. So much of memory palacing can happen in, in, in the head, in, internally, and that's a problem for me as an instructor because I can't see what's working and what's not. So mm -hmm. what we do is we have a very rigid, explicit, almost like it could be, it's not punishing, but it's like accountability. You have to write it all out. 
in a step. So it's like our, our memory palace process is a nine step process. So it starts with identifying content. So what do I want to learn? Like, let's say I'm going to do like Graves disease. So I've got the topic of Graves disease. And so I, I, number one, I have to figure out what's my topic. And then I want, and, and part of that is numerating it. How many pieces of information do I have? The numbering has to be explicit, including the title. So let's say I've got seven bullet points in the title. I've got eight things I need to know. Then I choose a real world space, RWS, real world space. What room am I going to use or pathway? So a lot of this is very much like it's just step by step, right? And the idea is if you teach it like this, then they can become more organic and fluid with it. So, you know, we have them. I need the content. Okay, I've got my grades of these eight items total. Determine the real world space. I'm going to use like this bedroom from Ritter Boulevard. Then you determine the re- RWI, real world items, low guide. So then we have them go around like on a whiteboard, bird's eye view. What items are we going to use? Maybe you populate the room with 10 things and you pick the, 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 ten, the eight best ones. So we need eight. Then we create a table. This is, this is a breakthrough seven or eight years ago. We make this, so it's like a, like a Word document or Excel document where it's, it's, you're going to write all the stuff out. And again, I don't care what they do later, as long as it's based. You can't tell, report it. I can't plug into somebody's head and see what they're thinking. So they, in the table, they're going to go in there and they're going to, you know, they're going to list the content. They're going to list the real world items are lined up and graves. The X off Falmos has to go with the TV. You know, it's, it's going to be very meticulously lined up. Like the bedside table has positive thyroid activating immunoglobulin. Like that has to go with that. And then we have them strip out the key sounds. So how many key sounds do I need for these links? So they strip out those key sounds. That's the fifth step. And so, you know, exophthalmos doesn't really have a key sound. I'm not going to have an X that I, I can read. Oh, it's like a giant bulging eyes. I can use bulging eyes. But some things might need, like graves, you guys even want one thing, a grave. That's fine, right? But some things are going to need multiple sounds, multiple, like the pre-tibial myxedema. I'm going to go with pre and mix. That's two things. That's a, I'm always going for what we call the MEL. The minimum effective link. These are all terms that we teach and illustrate in, in ex- exhausting detail, as well as should be, right? So you have your key sounds, and then you have to generate link ideas. Now, look, you're coming up with the link not in relation to the real world item. That, that paints people into a corner. If I've got like pre tibial mix edema, I've got pre mix, okay, pre, what can I use pre? I'll, I'll use like pre fontaine. I'll use like the Billy Cut, Billy Crudup version of the runner from the movie uh, without limits. Um, mix mixers, like like mixer heads on a, a blender thing, right? Okay, so those are my two links. I haven't done anything with them yet. Right now, this is very clerical, a little creative with the links. As we generate link, you know, we, we determine our links. Then link eight, we, we do what we call build our scene. And the scene is when we see the real world item. And then the weird thing happens with the link and that connects the two together. We want our link to usually, not always, usually be nouns to be things, concrete. We don't necessarily want them to be actions. We definitely don't want them to be adjectives. And again, can you do this? Yeah, of course. You can do adjectives. You can do verbs. But when we're trying to lay out best foundational processes, it's better to lay it out like this. And then they write the link, starting with zero, the real world item. And then you, what you don't see is like, I see the, a cartoon with somebody's eyes walking out. That's too realistic. We don't like that. We want it to break the rules of reality, but we want it to cross Hollywood special effects. I turn the TV on and these giant eyeballs like stretch out at me. Done. Because we only need that one thing. We, we like emotion. We like altering the real world item. We want it to have to cross Hollywood special effects. If it could happen in the real world, it's probably not good. And we want it written in that formula. I see this, the real world item, and this happens. We don't want to see it as a snapshot. So you can see, like Timothy, he tries to stress using these key sounds and minimum effective words within these sounds, within the topics we're trying to study, to make his visuals, to base them off of. But there's still one key step that's missing, and this is our rehearsal practice. The final step is we have, you have to do retrieval practice. You have to attempt recall and you just write it down on a dry erase board. And all you're doing, you're not writing Nemo and a clam and a table. You're just writing, oh, I see. You're just writing chlamydia pneumonia. That's all you're writing. But you're going through it in sequence. And our rule is four times in 48 hours. And then you have to self-check. The, 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 the artifact you created 
while making this thing is the record for posterity, for, for references. So now you've built this thing as, as a byproduct of creating it, and it's also the record against which you self-check. And again, like there's a learning curve to this. This is going to slow someone down profoundly at first. But once you get, and it's a steep learning curve, but once you get over that learning curve, I, I've had people hate the skill. And be like, I'm not going to use this. But it's like, well, you still have to learn it right now. And then they get into med school, say, so say a second year, they, they take class between first and second year. I don't like that. That's, that's too weird for me. Okay, well, practice it anyway. That's what you're here for. Then she gets into med school. She gets super sick in her farm unit. And she only has, like, has like a flu, like real sick. Three week block for farm, has only a week to do it. And so back against the wall, she memory palaces the heck out of all of the ugly, bad memory palaces, but using process. And she gets like an 80 sum on her exam, which she probably would have only got, you know, in her old way, maybe not even that. It's a really profound process. But I mean, you know this, I mean, you've been wrestling with this. It's hard. Indeed it is. These processes are a little difficult at first. And this is something I see all the time on different forums and on our Medical Anemonist Mastermind Facebook group. Students say that it's too hard or that they're not creative enough. They don't have creativity or it's just going to take too much time and they're not sure that's the best way to spend their time. Just remember, you don't need to use this for everything. But the more you do use it, the more regularly you try out these processes, the stronger you'll build your own personal technique. It's really useful for charts, tables, and similar and sometimes confusing comparisons between two diseases or similar processes. But you don't need to use it for everything. So make sure to use them when it's effective for you, when you're really struggling with something. These are key tools to add to your arsenal. And when you're first starting off, using some sort of system like this, writing out the key terms you need to remember, then adding a visual to each key term, and then placing them in a location, can be a great way to reduce your cognitive load and develop your own organic skill. Now let's see how Dr. Lev Goldentouch teaches his learners, and how it's described in his book, The Key to Study Skills. Once a person is capable of visualizing, we go to marking the important aspects in each article, the aspects that the person needs to remember. Then we group those aspects in groups of three words. And for those three words, we generate the PAO imagery, which means a person doing connection with an object. So each uh, trigram of a group of three words can be described this way. And the group of three words is very unique because it's probably the smallest number of words that can represent an entirely new subject in a reliable way. Uh, we do add some details uh, on the object mainly, but sometimes also on the person in the visualization. So each visualization may cover more than three words, up to seven words or something like that. Once we have those people, we, we have two different roles. One is we are mind maps, and this is something that Anna teaches. And the other one is uh, more of a mind palace. In the mind palace setup, we place the people in the corners of the room, like four corners and four walls. And uh, so we have uh, in the same room like eight visualizations. Each of the visualizations is like seven words. So we can cover about 50 words just in one room. And then we connect the rooms in some kind of mind palace with very fixed itineraries. As you can see, we've amped up the intensity a little bit here. We've moved on from the basic technique of writing out a list, a table, and then creating a single visual for each of these tables to now having one main marker with up to seven different linking markers to it. And this cluster, this category, this chunking of visuals all get placed in one location in a memory palace. And then you can add more chunks, more groupings of visuals to other areas of the memory palace. This is how memory champions remember hundreds, even thousands of digits and words in a very short amount of time. And you might worry about filling up your memory palace and not knowing where to go next. But this is where Lev introduces hyperlinking that's very similar to a hyperlink on an internet page. And you can use this visual hyperlink to jump from palace to palace. In fact, this is how he jumps from a single house or room as your memory palace to mind cities, memory cities of dozens or hundreds of these palaces. You can read a book or you can browse a web page. When you browse a web page, you have those small links 
which you press and go to other pages and then you can go back and forward and the entire internet is uh, at, at your pleasure. So if your memory works in the same way, then you are very effective at using it. Got it. So the hyperlinking is a computer term for those words which can be pressed and then go to something else. Mind cities and mind forests are two methods that I developed personally. They appear only in my uh, master class, which is paid and not very cheap. And they allow you to remember up to one million objects. Most of the methods that are used today allow you to remember up to 1,000 objects, 2,000 objects. Most of the memory championships stop at 2,000 objects. There is no point going beyond that. When you learn something from your, from your books, from your reading, for your own use, then you might need more than 1,000 or 2,000 objects. And then you need some uh, more scalable approach. So I take it uh, three zeros above 1,000. It's uh, about using the same uh, two techniques in a different combination. Memory cities is like city planning where each of the houses is a mental palace. So it's uh, like a mind map where you place mental palaces within. And mental forests are just the opposite. Uh, you have like different trees where each tree is a mind map and you place those trees in a forest where you can walk by, which is actually a mental path. So I'm just reusing the tools that should be already known with uh, some minor modifications, which allows them to be better used together. But as we've discussed, these techniques without some sort of other process are useless. They're going to fade. We need some sort of rehearsal. We need some way to bring these up again and again until we have them down in our long-term memory. So how do you tackle that problem with a large memory palace? When I need to really remember something, I write it down in a long list, like three words which remind me of that, which is my so-called anchor marker. And then when I uh, want to review the subjects that I needed to remember or needed to do, I go over those three words and try to memorize or to re recall the entire process or the entire idea that I had to deal with. And now we do it in different time intervals. So uh, I do it the next day. I review the aspects of the day that was before. And then probably several months later, I will review the entire list of aspects that had to do with a certain project. And then maybe a year after, I will review the issues that I didn't complete or the issues that I uh, marked for myself to study later. And this way, I will remember a lot of stuff for a lot of time. We can imagine using something like this, either writing down one, two, maybe three keywords on a flashcard, and then trying to recall the entire chunk of visual mnemonics on the back. Or if that's an extra step, simply use a flashcard or even a chart or a table to remind you of the key words there and visualize the chunk. Visualize all of the visual mnemonics that you had created for these keywords and where they're located in your memory palace or scene that you created. Okay, so now we have several different examples of how to start off, how to make a list of the key points we need to remember, how to use the key sounds in each of the words to create a visual, and then several different techniques to organizing our visual palaces, either through mind maps or memory palaces. And then we can create different location-based memories with these chunks of visuals that we've created, and then add them into some sort of space repetition. But the next step to really be aware of are the mistakes that we can make, some of the things that students do frequently that can cause them to waste some time when they start off with these before they become more proficient in these tools, in these techniques. Joining us first is Alex Mullen and Kathy Chen from Mullen Memory. When I started doing this, you know, and both of us, you know, this, this goes for both of us, we were making way too many images. I mentioned, you know, you take you know, the information, you turn it into some kind of mental picture. You really don't want to be doing that with every single thing you learn, you know, and, and that's what I tried to do at the beginning is just take everything that I was learning, turn it into pictures, and it quickly got very, very overwhelming. And then, you know, you realize that, you know, once you're a week or two into learning the material, a lot of those original images that you made are kind of useless to you because you already kind of understand the material, you know, on a somewhat intuitive level. And so a lot of those images aren't that helpful. And so you end up having this big sea of images only about 
you know, a few of which are actually useful to you and the rest you just sort of understand. So that was the really one of the key, you know, things that we that we've changed moving forward is that we really try to be very selective about what information we turn into images. You know, a lot of stuff we just we read it and we watch a video about it, we understand it, we don't make anything for it. But for those kind of more unintuitive, hard to remember details, those are the kind of things that we do create mental pictures for and place them in memory palaces. So let me reiterate this for about the dozenth time now. Don't create visuals for everything, or at least not at first. You probably won't need to create a visual for each and every word, topic, lab test, diagnostic test, and doing so is just going to cause more time to be wasted. Utilize it for the bits that are confusing, for the ones you're having trouble remembering. So why you might not want to implement this until your second or third repetition of your flashcards or whatever space repetition software or technique you are implementing. At that point, whatever you're having trouble with after a third repetition is likely something that you can greatly benefit from using these techniques with. Another common complaint and worry that I hear from students is that they can't make enough palaces. They don't have enough locations to put these. And I have to agree with Kathy Chen's response right here. Number one is to realize that I'm never going to run out of space. Like there are so many palaces out there and they don't actually have to be in the same physical space in the real world. I can just kind of link them in my mind and it becomes very organic. So for example, you know, I remember memorizing all of my like CNS um, information in different places. I memorized some in Alex's apartment in college, some at his childhood home, but in my mind now they're very linked. So for me, that really expands the space that I can memorize things. I don't feel like I have to cram it. And then the second kind of check for myself to make sure I'm not over cramming is I try to only place information at loci in the room that I know I can see out of my peripheral vision. So I try to imagine myself standing in that room and then I say, are these things and pictures and images things that I can see if I were just like scanning around with my peripheral vision? And I think that keeps me from packing it too closely and just being able to have a more intuitive sense of, oh, this is what's in the room with me. And if we're not overusing visualization, if we're not creating too many for topics that we can remember innately and don't need to add this extra step to, then we'll have much more room in our palaces. Just remember to keep a list of every place that you've ever been, every place that you go, as more of them come to mind, write them down on this chart, on this table, wherever you're keeping track of it, and use those in the future. But we might be focusing too much on visualizations. I know it's a strong one for me. I love looking at different things because it sticks better. I love watching a video as opposed to reading a textbook. And we know that the visual aspect and visual spatial aspect of these techniques is very strong, but they're not the only ones we can use. As Anthony Mativier from the Magnetic Memory Method states here. I think that visualization is part of the problem because you don't need to visualize things actually, not in the usual sense. You don't have to see this in your mind. You can feel it. You can feel things spatially where a corner is. You can think of the actual physical presence of you can, for example, if we were going to put the radius on him or the radio with the US sticker on him, we could actually feel what that would be like to hold, to be Batman and to hold that radio. We could hear what song was playing on there. And it might be the song Radio by the band Rancid, right? Just to grind it in. Because if you're trying to see it only, then you're really robbing yourself of the quick results. This was also echoed by Nelson Dellis in the past. Adding that emotional tone can really add a lot to it, but also adding texture, adding sound. The other senses are very strong as well, perhaps for some even stronger than visual. So mix it up, add different senses, add different feelings and emotional tone to your visuals and help separate them from other similar ones you've created or add extra strength to the long-term memory. So one of the common mistakes is not creating memory palaces effectively. And so much of the teaching out there says, start at your door and then move inside of the building. And there's no doubt that that can work. But I found again and again and again in my own practice and in the practice of many, many thousands of people that if you would just actually draw your memory palace and think about it logically, the worst place to start is the door and moving inside because you're going to lead yourself into a dead end. So if you just take a look at your little drawing there of your apartment, it's just a floor plan sort of sketch. It takes two minutes. Don't 
you know, turn it into the Mona Lisa or anything, just a sketch uh, of the floor plan squares on a piece of paper. And you think, where's the dead end here? You find it and then you move towards the entrance and you move toward the entrance in the most linear and least forgettable way that, that you can imagine. And you will make it so much easier for yourself. And then you'll be able to add more to the memory palace because you've led yourself towards an exit. So I'm giving away some of what's in the free course, but that's exactly the most common pitfall of all is that people can't figure out how to use memory palaces. I started to like make these little terms of the problems that people have is because they, they tell me, I, I, what, what, what do I do when I run out of space? And I call that memory palace scarcity and memory palace claustrophobia because they're leading themselves into the dead end and they're freaking out. So just reverse the process. Start at the dead end, which I now call the terminal station, and move your way outwards. So that's a huge thing. Another pitfall is that people just simply don't use their existing memory enough. They're trying to invent things. So back to radius, right? I'm not inventing a radio. I'm thinking of the radio that I used to have. And then when I wanted to add a US sticker, well, I used to have a US sticker or better said, my dad had one on his toolbox. And so I'm thinking of that. It already exists in my mind. And then the song I mentioned by Rancid, radio, you know, radio, 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 radio. Like I'm hearing that in my mind and it makes it so much easier to remember radius later. Uh, that was the word, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. I just <laughs> want to be sure. <laughs> Ulna radius humorous. Um, it's so much easier to remember because I have so many different multi-sensory, real lived memories that I'm drawing upon, right? I'm not inventing anything. It's not hard work at all because it's already there. And so when a lot of people come to memory, they go to some source of mnemonics, they have to learn the mnemonics, and then they're just creating a job. Whereas, you know, if you take a, it doesn't matter how difficult the term is, if you just split it up, and I'm sure you could give me some bizarre long term with multiple syllables. If you just break it up, you will find that there are things that are already in your mind that you can associate it at a syllabus by syllabus level so that you get the sound matched with your personal biography, your autobiographical memory, your episodic memory, your figural memory, your procedural memory, even, even if you don't move your body. You know, you have their memory of what it's like to move your body. So you can tap into the actual movement part of your memory and you just weave it all together and you don't invent a, th a thing. So in the actual design of your mnemonics, especially when it comes to memory palaces, that does seem to vary quite a bit from instructor to instructor. Anthony Mativier prefers this inward to outward structure in a way. Whereas Lev Golden Touch said it didn't really matter for him because he hyperlinks them together. I've heard of others adding similar things to hyperlinking, similar techniques that are basically like portals that open up within one of the rooms, on a wall, on a ceiling, and lead to a different house or a different room that wouldn't logically connect in real life. So find out what works for you and how your creative juices flow and stick with that. The point here is not to give you exact directions, but to give you many options to play around with, to experiment, and to develop your own organic skill. And notice that he also says very, very underused aspect of these memories and memory-associated skills is our personal experiences. We probably know innately if one of our fellow classmates has had a baby, they're going to do much better at embryology and ob gyn stuff than those of us that haven't had a kid. But what about other medical problems that have arisen in our own lives or with those that we love. Use those experiences, whether positive or negative, within your memory devices, within your mnemonics. Those personal experiences will form such a strong link. One of the main problems I had when I was in medical school and using the memory palace technique was there simply wasn't enough places to store the information. Like I use my house from when I was in China. I used my uh, house when I first came to America, when I was in Wisconsin, when I was in Chicago, my medical school, and then all the areas around my medical school. So I, I was running out of actual places to use. So I was like, okay, what if I just use, what's the fastest way of getting a bunch of locations 
the first thing I tried was to look at a home decor magazine. Like I got a bunch of them from the library. And I was just using the most, uh, the rooms that stands out to me, like a really fancy kitchen or a bedroom with zebra striped pattern. When I actually tried to put the information I want to learn into these rooms, it didn't work out too well. Like I couldn't retain them anywhere close to the level that I could when I was actually using a space I knew. The next thing I tried was actually video games. For example, a game like Skyrim where you play as a character walking around in a Nordic countryside. And that actually worked out really well for me. And there's research to back up, back this up. Lucky for us, we have been able to learn over the past year or so and through interviews with these experts and memory champions that there is no limitation to these memory palaces like unfortunately Yifan ran into. Because we didn't have these skills and these educational programs such as this show when we were back in our basic sciences. So there are ways around it. But I'm glad to see that he also found ways to overcome it by using digital media and other visual and non-real locations for his memory palaces. It demonstrates that this skill is infinitely versatile. It just comes to you and how much time you want to put into it and develop this skill. Uh, one mistake I made when I was starting out is I wasn't picking and choosing which subjects I wanted to use the memory palace on. I thought it was going to be a silver bullet that's going to solve all my problems in medical school, right? And it turns out that wasn't the case. When you're starting out, some subjects might be too difficult for you to properly apply these techniques. And that's actually what happened with me and one of the first courses I took, which was anatomy. I think the problem was there was just too much information. There's too many muscles, too many nerves, too many bone features for me to make an image for each thing I need to remember in a timely fashion. I was, you know, actually lagging behind the rest of the class. So I had to stop applying the memory palace technique to that subject. But at the same time, I was having great success with other courses like histology and biochem in particular. And it was so easy to make a memory palace of the pathways that, you know, I was actually ahead of the class. So I was actually reading ahead of the the class lectures and then, you know, like being two or three weeks ahead of everyone else. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, that's why it's important to pick something fitting for your skill level, especially when you're starting out. And we'll say it one more time. We don't need to make memory palaces for everything, as he found out, and as I've run into in the past too. Trying to make too dense of visuals or too many palaces initially, when you might just be able to remember that material without the need of this extra visual aid, is not productive. It's not efficient. Maybe wait a little bit and utilize it when it's going to come in and be the most helpful. My current recommendation is after your third space retrieval, if you have your card set up properly or your space retrieval set properly. And some students might want to take an easier route and use maybe a digital form of mind maps and of memory palace creation. But Brad Zup recommends you might want to think again. Probably the majority of the people who are students right now are probably younger and technology is cool. And we've got phones, we've got tablets, and we've got computers that we carry everywhere with us. And there's mind mapping software. And I would recommend not using it. I would recommend getting out, go to Staples or Target or whatever, and get a 12-pack of colored pens and get a, I don't know, 11 by 17 pad of paper and draw out your mind maps after reading a book on how to do it. The, the act of actually putting pen and different pen color onto paper, most people find is much more memorable than using a computer program. So besides a warning away from the digital media aspect of these memory devices, which makes sense, they're not as personal to us and they're limited in what they can create. What is the biggest challenge that students run into? They don't do it. (laughs) That's a very common problem. (laughs) It's like, oh, that sounds hard. Or, you know, I'm doing fine. You know, I'm, I'm, my grade point average is whatever. and, and, And that's fine. You know, as long as I graduate, they're still going to call me doctor. Well, just try it. Take, uh, we'll we'll do, we'll do 60 second memory uh, improvement here. Let's see. Good. And just start it. 
So first step, memory palace. Picture your, the room that you spend the most time in. Go around the room and find 10 obvious places, one after another, to record, store information. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be fancy. It's just like, well, that's first because that's the couch and there's a lamp and there's this. There's 10 obvious spots in your room that if you close your eyes now, you can think of them. If you close your eyes again and say, what was the fifth one? The fifth one will be the same when you think about it next time too. That's your memory palace. Then go to the thing you're having trouble learning, translate it into a picture and put it in the memory palace in room one. Go to the next thing, put it in memory two or palace room two. Do the same thing 10 times, review it once, come back tomorrow, close your eyes and go, okay, what was in room number one, room number two or location number three, location number four and see that it works. I think we as Americans especially have this, uh, this weird, I don't know if it's a fetish or what, but we have this, this fixation with gathering more information as opposed to applying information. So we, we, we want to read more about memory improvement. We want to listen to more podcasts about memory improvement, but we don't want to sit down with an app and work at memory improvement. So I'm so guilty. gather the information, go onto the, your Facebook page, post, hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to come back in an hour and I'm going to post a reply to my original post saying I did it and what my experiences were. Anybody else in? And then shut the computer down and go do it or close Facebook down and go do it and see if it benefits you. Try it. And I am still guilty of this. It doesn't matter how many interviews I've done. And maybe this has to do with a longer period of time needing to create a new habit than I've really put into it. But I'm always collecting more information. I'm always trying to tackle every book, every podcast, every resource out there, take every online course. But I don't often sit back and just try to master the first stage, get down the foundations. This is a very, very common problem for students. And it's difficult in this day and age to focus on one thing and really focus on mastering that before moving on to the next stage because there's so much information out there and more every day that we feel we have to tackle. In our upcoming episode, we will cover mastery in more detail with our deliberate practice discussion with Dr. K. Anders Eriksson, author of Peak. But for the moment, let's get back to our last couple of mistakes for memory palace creation. I provide like 10, 10 different techniques to mix and match to overcome the mental barriers. Anna uses about 50 techniques, which she kind of pinpoints to the personal needs. Uh, the first uh, and the most important issue is just to let go. People who are too obsessed and, or too much in control cannot visualize very well. They're, they're not creative enough. They stop their visualization. Then uh, do not expect too much. People which are too judgmental start uh, saying, well, I have this visualization, it is not too good, they are changing it constantly and cannot fix upon one visualization. The idea is to fix on the first thing that comes up and add details to it, like uh, the first associations that jumps into your brain, no matter how stupid. It kind of takes time to teach your brain to come up with good visualizations uh, without uh, special preparation. And this is why preparing for your study sessions can be so important, making sure you have all the supplies you need, you know where you're going, you kind of have a rough draft in your head, you're in the right mindset. Once you're prepared, the process of studying in general, let alone creating complex visual mnemonics, becomes that much easier. But there are some pitfalls to the memory palace that we should probably be aware of. At least on the normal way of thinking about it, they have a certain kind of inflexibility. So if we plan out our memory palaces before we start memorizing, and let's say we, we sort of plan out, this memory palace has like 100 stages, and then we fill those 100 stages with information. Let's say we're memorizing historical dates, and we sort of lay down, let's say we memorize the 100 most important dates in history, and we build a memory palace with 100 stages, and we go through and we put them down. One problem with this is, well, what happens if we want to we go back and learn more dates? It looks like our memory palace is full. There's no way for us to kind of like add additional information. So memory palaces suffer from this certain kind of inflexibility if we think about them in that way. But I think with, with a few sort of changes, with a sort of slight shift in thinking, we can solve these kinds of problems. Once you've sort of laid down all your images, let's say you know them fairly well, then the thing to do is to stop thinking of those as images in a memory palace, but think of them as features of the memory palace itself. Think of them, so in the same way, you know, you might have like, let's say one part of your memory palace originally might've been a table. 
And then, you know, on the table, you place an image that represents something. Let's say that image is like a panda bear juggling pineapples or something. I don't know what this could encode, but let's just pretend. Okay. Well, after a while, after you know that stuff really well, then you can think, go back and you can actually think of the, of the panda bear juggling pineapples as a stage in your memory palace as part of the landscape. And then it actually becomes a kind of location upon which you can add further images and further elaboration. To me, this sounds very similar to what Dr. Lev Golden Touch spoke about earlier, and also what Jonathan Levy from the Super Learners course spoke about in our earlier episode, and that's adding linking markers to your anchor marker. And actually, once that combination of your anchor marker with its linking visuals attached to it becomes solidified, you can add more to that. Of course, we can go infinitely complex there, but we don't want to become overly dense with our visuals. We can easily create just a new one. But this is a great way to add new information later on, once we receive medical updates or something like that. And lastly, back to Lev Golden Touch. Some things can be really damaging. For example, when you study speed reading, you study how you move your eyes, uh, so-called saccading techniques of uh, various sorts. And if you do not move your eyes properly or do not get enough rest between moving your eyes, you may get hurt. You may actually get hurt in various ways like uh, eye strain, headaches, and stuff like that. We added certain techniques like eye gymnastics and so on to help, but you need to listen to your body very accurately and very carefully. And if you feel that something goes wrong, you should be able to react to it. And then there are common problems like not getting enough sleep, which is uh, one of the first in the list. The people who do not get enough sleep, uh, they work hard and notice degradation in performance. And this is uh, really hard because they start working yet more. And then they see further degradation and so on. It's really a vicious cycle. So sleep is very important and working enough but not too hard is also very important. Like we have different visualizations and these visualizations connect uh, to each other like uh, associations. So we need to have stable associations and those associations need to involve as much of your brain as possible to become yet stronger. So we kind of add different things that already are inside your brain, like your personal memories, your senses, your brain chemicals, like uh, something which is associated with excitement. One of the strongest uh, forces in memorizing something is so-called flashbulb memory. When you have a traumatic event, you remember everything about it. So we kind of generate pivotal experiences if we really want to remember something. Again, common, common. We are too hard on ourselves. We think we're not creative enough. We can't utilize these techniques and learn these tools properly. And that's just not the truth. So don't be hard on yourself. Try them out just a little bit at a time. Add it to your daily practice, your daily routine. You will get better, and these will help you later on. Before we get to the summation of our key points for this episode, let's quickly look at some of the mistakes that can happen during our speed reading. Some things can be really damaging. For example, when you study speed reading, you study how you move your eyes, uh, so-called saccading techniques of uh, various sorts. And if you do not move your eyes properly or do not get enough rest between moving your eyes, you may get hurt. You may actually get hurt in various ways like uh, eye strain, headaches, and stuff like that. We added certain techniques like eye gymnastics and so on to help, but you need to listen to your body very accurately and very carefully. And if you feel that something goes wrong, you should be able to react to it. And then there are common problems like not getting enough sleep, which is uh, one of the first in the list. The people who do not get enough sleep, uh, they work hard and notice degradation in performance. And this is uh, really hard because they start working yet more. And then they see further degradation and so on. It's really a vicious cycle. So sleep is very important and working enough but not too hard is also very important. Like So with these skills, with the direction from these experts, you can improve your study tactics, learn these memory techniques, and excel in your academic success. These are also useful in residency and afterwards too. So try them out, little bit by little bit. 
You don't learn a new language in a day. It's a little bit at a time over a long period of time, like most learning. All right, so now we're up to the key takeaways from this episode part, but real quick, I do want to say thank you everyone that showed up for the last Medical Nemonist meetup. These are going to be held more regularly. You can find them currently at freemeded.org slash meetup or in the notes for this episode. We're going to try to do them at least once a month, maybe bi-weekly, so you can join for free. Come on, chat with me, ask any questions you might have, and get answers from myself and from the community. And the Online Medical Education Summit is still being planned probably for the end of May or beginning of June. We're finalizing it with a bunch of vendors and trying to work out discounts for all of you. This will be a virtual summit and free, at least as far as we can see for several thousand students and maybe for everyone. So do keep tuned to this podcast for future updates, to our social media feeds as well. If you're signed up for the newsletter on FreeMedEd, that's a great way to get updates too. But you might want to get a few of these just in case you miss a social media post or miss an email for a while. Once the page is up and running, it will be at freemeded.org slash O-M-E-S for the Online Medical Education Summit. It's going to be really fun. I'm getting really excited about this as we're getting closer to the date. Hopefully a lot of the current pandemic scare will be calming down by then. But even if not, luckily we have this digital media that we can use and connect with each other and learn with each other. And the key takeaways finally, that you've been waiting for. I would say the first key point is just to start at the beginning. Have some sort of structure, especially if you're new to these techniques, in which to write out all of the key points that you want to add to your palaces or to make a visual for. By writing these out, you also have a way of keeping yourself honest and referring back to it later on in case you forget something. Create these visuals one by one, skipping around if you need to and coming back to a more difficult one later on, and then add them to a location. We often say memory palace, and this could be any visual or even digital creation of your mind. Something that you have experienced, something that you've seen, anything you can strongly picture. But then also add extra cues, extra sensations, extra emotional tone to strengthen those visuals. You can implement more advanced techniques like hyperlinking, memory cities, and mind forests to remember larger amounts of information. And then you want to avoid the pitfalls of negative self-talk, saying you don't have creativity or it's just going to take too long. You want to avoid making your visuals too overly dense or falling into the trap of limited memory palaces because you're not keeping track of all the palaces you actually have. With these tips, with these skills that we have developed over the past three episodes and through past episodes of this show, you can easily become a master of your own memory. Of course, if you need any assistance, please reach out to me. You can always go to freemeded.org slash tutoring to receive your tutoring sessions. Those actually might be becoming free for you very soon. And we have, if nothing else, the Medical Nemesis meetups, which will be free from here on out as far as we can see. Join us. Stay safe during these hectic times. You got this. We'll catch you on the next show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For links to connect to us, email us, or for previous episodes, please see the show notes. We'd also love to hear from you. So please send an email or join us on the Medical Nemesis Mastermind Facebook group. Any ideas, tips, tricks, people that you'd like to hear interviewed, we'd love to hear it. Any advice to make the show better and more enjoyable would be greatly appreciated.